Low interest rates, we've often been told, are a good thing. Low interest rates apparently stimulate economic growth and they create general prosperity. But Edward Chancellor has written a rather wonderful book, The Price of Time, that challenges this orthodox idea about low interest rates and what they do for the economy. Edward, thank you so much for joining. Pleasure to be with you. What, what are interest rates and why are they so important? Well, the interest is a charge for the use of somebody's capital of their private property over a period of time. And we have a history of interest and interest rates going back at least five millennia to the dawn of recorded civilization. And it's extremely unlikely that, that the institution of lending at, at interest would have been going on for so long unless interest served a number of important functions. And I start the book writing about interest in ancient Mesopotamia and show that in that period, we have several of the uses of interest that we would find commonplace today. And we have loan contracts in, in the form of clay tablets uh, that record loans for commercial uses. So for instance, in ancient Mesopotamia, a, a merchant uh, going on a, an overseas voyage would borrow money and the interest rate would reflect both the a charge for the use of capital, but also a risk charge in case the ship went down. We have we have uh, loans for property, and you frankly you can't have a property market or traded property market without interest because you need some way of discounting future rents back to their present value in order to put a value on property and to make loans and and mortgages. We have agricultural loans. And if you look at the early etymologies of, um, of, of the word interest in various languages, whether it's in, in uh, Sumerian or, or Greek or, or Latin, uh, you find they're related to um, the productivity of the loans, um, namely the product, the, the birth of livestock. So in, in, um, in, in in, in Assyrian, it is uh, mash, which means uh, a goat or a lamb. And in um, and the word for interest in, in ancient Greek is tokos, uh, which means a calf. And capital, as you know, in, in Latin, it, it derives, from, um, derives from the word, uh, for, word for cattle. And, and I think pecunia is a flock. So you, you have this sense pecunia of- Pecunia pecuniary interest. Yes. So, so you have this sense that, um, that, and these are probably, you know, in prehistorical periods, the first loans uh, were probably of grain and cattle. And as I mentioned in the book, you know, the Americans were lending livestock um, and taking a, a charge in the form of uh, of an extra p cattle, or, yeah, these were cattle, uh, in the of a, a charge of an extra calf for the loan of a cow. And so that 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 type of lending has, has gone on since time immemorial. So th this idea that you um, lend capital and you charge interest on it, it's, it's, it's long established and it's, it's essential for a smooth functioning economic system. Um, but slightly more recently, um, we've come up with this idea that central bankers determine the rate of interest. I, 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 describe that. How did we end up with a situation in free market capitalist societies where the rate of interest is determined by, in effect, a government, a government quango, a government bureaucracy. Well, I think the, if you will, the problem started when we shifted off the gold standard. I mean, the, we, we you had, you know, Bank of England was founded in 1694, at the end of the 17th century, and it slowly took on uh, the functions of, of, of a national bank. It wouldn't have been called a, a central bank in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But once you uh, once you you cease to have cease to be lending, um, you know the the since once the foundations of, of the monetary system cease to be uh, in in a in a precious metal um, that that cannot be created at will, um, and once you have what we call a fiat currency, which is in effect conjured up either by the central bank um, 
uh, at will, by sort of stroke, or, or, or by commercial banks when they make loans. Under that type of system, uh, you then then the, the the charge of interest is not really against something that is finite because money is sort of potentially infinite uh, under that system. So then you get into uh, a world in which the central bankers um, take charge of actually determining at least the short term rate of interest, what we call the policy rate. Mm -hmm. And then the longer term rate of interest is, is determined, so to speak, by the market. But as I mentioned in the book, there are a number of ways in which the, the, the central bank's policy rate uh, influences what the long bond yield is. So central bankers like to pretend, oh, we only affect the short term end of the market. Our actions only affect uh, um, the, the short, only have short running implications. I'm arguing in the book that actually uh, the policy rate, the short term central bank rate actually influences the bond yield, particularly when they go in for, for other actions that we've seen in the last 15 years or so, quantitative easing, where the central bank goes in and, and buys government bonds, forward guidance, where the central bank actually signals to the market what its future interest rate movements are likely to be. So in that sense, um, I'm arguing that the, the central banks do have uh, a much stronger influence over the entire spectrum of interest rates than they often uh, pretend to be the case. So once you move to a system of entirely fiat currency, um, who sets and how they set the rate of interest becomes enormously important. Um, and talk us through a little bit about this because we've as you point out we've only really had this system since 1914 or, or certainly since 1971 when we completely cut the link between uh, fiat money and, and gold and since then central bank has it's been enormously controversial hasn't it what what should the rate of interest be and in your book you point out that in the 1920s in america um the rate at which interest was set had enormous implications um, talk us through what, what is the argument in favour of central bankers keeping the rate low and what is the argument in favour of them raising it? So, Doug, this is not really about central bankers keeping the interest, the rate of interest low per se. Um, there is what I argue is that after the First World War, we moved away from the so-called classical gold standard towards a sort of quasi gold standard in which the Federal Reserve in particular uh, was was had much greater freedom to set interest rates, no longer determined by the amount of of gold in the central bank vaults. Mm -hmm. Now, the the important thing is that once the central banks actually start um, determining the interest rate, the question is what criteria they use in order to set the rate. Now, in the nineteen twenties, for the first time, they started they they embraced the 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 uh, notion of of price stability of saying uh, as long as as interest uh, as long as inflation was neither falling uh, in in other words okay, uh, so negative and i deflation or inflation was was high say about in, in that case they didn't really have a, a target level but um, as long as inflation was sort of trending around zero uh, they considered that to be the correct rate. And what I argue in the book is that actually the 1920s was a period of extraordinary productivity growth in the United States, you know, associated with you know, the you, um, massive growth in, 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 in motor cars and the extension of, of, of electric utilities and new modes of, of production. And um, GDP uh, was growing at times at, at, at 8%. A year. I mean, really, the greatest period of growth, economic growth in U.S. history, and yet interest rates were, on the whole, less than half that level. So they didn't they didn't look, at, and 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 prices were stable over the course of the decade. So, at some level, you could say the central banks were doing the right thing. They got they delivered a stable price level. My argument in the book, which I draw and in, in which I draw on the the early work of the Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek, who was actually uh, I think he was doing a doctorate at NYU in in the Fed's uh, monetary policy by you know, right man in the right place. And and Hayek was an early cri critic 
of of price stabilization and argued uh, that that this policy was leading to credit being too low low and leading to a credit boom and a speculative bubble. And um, so you could say that Hayek's prediction was borne out by the 1929, that the stock market boom up to 29, and then the crash followed by the depression. Um, as it turns out, sort of Hayek's views was sort of, you know, didn't really win in, in, in academia over the following decade when the ideas and, of, of John Maynard Keynes took sway. And Keynes, you know, belonged to the school that felt the price stability was the proper goal of central banks, and that and Keynes was a you know a fierce enemy of high interest. He Keynes actually believed that the problems of the 1920s and 30s were was caused by excessively high interest rates. And I argue in the in my book against that. Now, if we fast forward 70 years or so, what you find is that the central banks uh, were adopting the same type of um, uh, policy mandate, if you will, uh, as in the 1920s, except this time, you know, typically uh, much more focused. Uh, cent central banks around the world took this, um, this inflation target, uh, generally around 2%, and they did everything uh, possible to prevent inflation from falling below 2%. Two, 2%. And in, in, in pursuit of that target, of which, um, as you know, I'm critical of, uh, they then took interest rates down to the lowest levels in five millennia, and in Europe and Japan to actually negative levels, uh, something that really had only been imagined by economists. And it, it's hard, it's hard. We're, we're sort of accustomed to the idea of negative interest rates because of our recent experience, but frankly, <laughs> I mean, you know, if you'd go back to before the global financial crisis, it, 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 no, no one would have considered that um, a likelihood or a possibility. So, so the second half or two thirds of my book is a sort of exploration of both the function of interest, various functions of interest, but also how these, these extraordinary low interest rates have had a number of problems. Before we get on to talking about some of the consequences of, of low interest rates, I just wanted to dwell on this idea about our, our views about the, the Great Depression in America, the, the, the 1929 crash. And, and it's important, as you say, because in the 20s, the central bank tried price stability. Um, from the late 1990s and the early noughties, they tried price stability. And perhaps our, our, our view of what went wrong in the 1920s is incredibly important. You, you touched on Hayek's interpretation of what went wrong. He basically said that the, that the bank in pursuit of price stability set interest rates too low, that created an artificial boom ending in bust. But that's that's a very minority view. Ben Bernanke, for example, he, he takes a very different view. Um, wh why are views about what happened in the late 1920s so important? Well, I mean, you know, the, the views of economic history, um, at least um, when expressed by economists, uh, often have a very sort of dogmatic, um, almost sort of theological position. And, and the, the Bernanke view uh, follows actually from Milton Friedman's idea that the, that the problem of, of the uh, of the Great Depression, that the Great Depression almost, in their view, is something that sort of ha happened out of nowhere, sort of a, a, a blizzard on a summer's day that couldn't have been predicted. They argue, and this is again following Milton Friedman, that had the money supply not contracted after 1929, uh, then all would have been well. And they blame the, uh, the Great Depression on the, the collapse of the money supply and what the contemporary uh, American economist Irving Fisher uh, called the debt deflation. Well, he wrote a famous paper, the debt, de the debt deflation theory of great depressions. And so that, that is the, um, you know, that's a sort of, if you will, the canonical view. Um, the, the problem to my mind uh, with, with that view is, first of all, 
I mean, if you if you actually read Fisher's paper, he actually points out that debt deflation appears after the buildup of debt. So you you want <laughs> if you if you want to avoid a debt deflation, um, it's best to um, it's best not to have too rapid credit growth. Um, now that's what we had in the 1920s, and that's what we had up to the global financial crisis. And what induces rapid credit growth is when the cost of leverage, which is the term, one of the definitions of interest, is taken down to too low a level, and it pays people to lever up assets, and you get real estate booms, speculative bubbles, and so forth. So that that the, the whole problem of the excess leverage, or the notion that the 1920s depression was, in inverted commas, a credit boom gone wrong, is, is swept under the carpet. In the, in the analyses of Bernanke and, and Friedman, the, um, the Hayekian critique uh, at the time is, is completely ignored. Uh, it's just cut out. An, an honest intellectual debate, as you know, requires one to take on board the views of those one disagrees with and actually dismantle them and negate them. Th this is never done in, in the history of the 1920s and 30s. What, what you might call the Hayekian critique, it, it's ignored after the 1929 crash. It's also ignored after the Lehman's um, 2007. Um, and it has quite grave implications. The, the, the errors of monetary policy in the late 1990s and the early noughties, far from learning from Lehman's, your book shows that in a sense, we sort of double down. Um, central bankers um, carry on doing more of the same. Yeah, so, so um, I think 2002, uh, Milton Friedman had his 90th birthday party and the, the Fed, Fed gave a, a party and, and Bernanke then was a, a, a governor of the Federal Reserve um, shortly to become chairman. And he said to rather facetiously to Milton Friedman, um, don't we apolo he apologized on behalf of the Federal Reserve for causing the Great Depression and ensuring that it would never happen again. And you know, five years after we had, you know, the next, you know, the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression. But what's interesting is in the aftermath, we had the type of policies that both actually Friedman and Keynes would have approved of. And what did they deliver us? They delivered us the slowest period of economic growth since the Great Depression, rising inequality and a host of other problems. So yes, we avoided the uncontrolled collapse of the credit system, but we got ourselves into a host of other problems. Let's talk about some of those other problems, because what's really striking about your book is how it provides, I think, a very convincing explanation for what's called the productivity puzzle. Um, uh, you know, it's quite striking that since 2008, um, in the decade after the 2008 um, financial crisis, Britain, I think you said, has had the slowest productivity growth since the Industrial Revolution. Um, you, you've had these incredible asset bubbles. You see, um, you know, companies that are basically a, a line of coding valued at, you know, a billion dollars. Talk, talk uh, you, you explain that this is this is often a consequence of, of low interest rates. Talk a little bit about some of these unintended consequences of, of low interest rates. So I I have a a chapter on um, on 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 the allocation of capital, and um, I think it's called unnatural selection. <laughs> now, think uh, another uh, great economist, uh, uh, contemporary of Hayek's, is, is Joseph Schumpeter, who who ended up at, at, at Harvard. And Schumpeter, as you know, uh, developed the theory of, of, of uh, the economy being a process of, of creative destruction, of constant change. And what that requires is that capital is taken from uh, from unproductive uses and reallocated to um, to more productive uses. And it's through that process of creative destruction that we get productivity growth, economic growth, uh, rising incomes and general prosperity. And, and I, now this is unfashionable, again, <laughs> among the consensus view, it's very unfashionable to point out that the 1920s, although a period for for a very short period, there was a you know, 
extremely high unemployment in the US, 25% of the workforce was unemployed. But actually, if you look at the decade as a whole, um, it was one of very high productivity growth. And as I show, uh, in fact, uh, um, an American economist has written a book uh, about that period called The Great Leap Forward. Uh, and he, and, and as I show in the book, uh, areas such as um, railroads, car manufacturing, and so forth, experienced extraordinary productivity gains during that period. And so by the early 1940s, the US uh, economy was back to its trend growth period, um, trend growth line from before the Great Depression. So if you had sort of managed, I'm not saying one would wish it on, you know, on anyone to have gone through those few harrowing years, but at least you can say that, uh, by, you know, if you were at the start of your career, the, the Great Depression, aside from being a sort of inconvenience and unpleasantness, it didn't permanently affect your, 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 your income prospects or your wealth prospects. Now, if you compare that to what we've already now had, what, um, you know, sort of 13, 14 years since the, glo since the global financial crisis. And I don't think that, and I, I, mean, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'd say that sort of GDP uh, probably is around you know, 20 to 30% less than its trend period. And we're, we're simply not going to get back to the trend uh, growth period that we had before uh, you know, before the financial crisis, any time soon. So, uh, you know, frankly, if you if you came from outer space, you'd say, well, that was a sort of nasty experience the Americans had in 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 the early 1930s, but it wasn't sort of so to speak life threatening. What we've been going through now is much strong. Is a much it it may be less. You know, we, you may see it less in in headline unemployment, but it's a much uh, a much, uh, a much longer, deeper pain that our economies appear to be suffering from. So, in a sense, central bankers have tried to achieve stability, economic stability, and in doing so, they've almost sort of wrapped our Western economies in in sort of cotton wool. And and what you're saying is, you need that instability, however unpleasant it might be at times. You need that instability to constantly make sure that labor and capital that's inefficiently allocated gets efficiently allocated and if you don't have those periods of occasional downturn you end up with a sort of sclerotic obese economy that can't really can't really perform and you're saying that's more or less what we've got now yes i mean there is a you know the the labor market economists do, do have a theory of what they call the pit stop theory of recession uh where you, you know, like you know Formula One racing, you put the car into the pit stop, change its brakes and tyres and give it a bit more gas and off it goes. Um, now, it, uh, what was interesting after the global financial crisis is that although there was all this talk about the Great Recession and so forth, in fact, it was actually there were far fewer bankruptcies in the US and the UK than in the um, than in the previous recessions of after uh, you know early 2000s and early 1990s. And it looks as if um, the Trump in the in the you know, in in it in the in pursuit of stability, as you say, the the creative destruction or, or forces in, in in the economy were were, were muted. And and for Schumpeter, Schumpeter would said, you know, the capitalist system cannot function if cre if creative destruction is thwarted. And there, you know, one of the things we see. Uh, is that the appearance of the so-called zombie companies, companies uh, that that should really have had their capital taken away, but thanks to uh, very low interest rates, are able. Which, and these low interest rates are a form of loan forbearance, if you will. That these very low interest rates keep them in in business. And, and this is not really something we just see in the U.S. We see it in the U.K. We see it in uh, particularly in the periphery of Europe, in places like Italy. We see it in. In China, so it's a sort of global phenomenon. So these zombie companies, they they can carry on, but they can't really grow. But perhaps most important, they prevent any new competitors coming in because they're kind of there and they've got low margins, and it just means that it's difficult for a new startup to come against them. 
Yeah, that's particularly the case is that they, 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 those sectors have um, less productivity growth, less investment and fewer new entrants. And, and bear in mind, again, go back to our friend Schumpeter. He says it, for Schumpeter, the, the, the entrepreneur is the key uh, figure in the, in the capitalist system. And, it, and, and uh, as I point out, uh, that, that business, business deaths in the US in 2016 exceeded business births for the first time since the Census Bureau started collecting uh, data. So you can see that there's something that the, the sort of creative destruction uh, possibly linked to the zombie phenomenon uh, was being thwarted. Now, Austrians have this rather clumsy term called malinvestment to describe this idea of capital being invested in things it shouldn't. I mean, essentially, when interest rates are really low, you don't have the, 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 the pricing signal to tell you what is a good investment and what's a bad investment. Well, it, it makes rather disturbing reading, though, because you, you talked about not, you know, companies, more companies going under than, than being created. And we've had a huge number of tech startups and we like to think that there's this enormous amount of wealth being created by these new tech companies. But reading your book, there's this terrible thought in the back of one's mind that perhaps actually this is rather like the tulip bubble. Maybe tech stocks or a lot of tech stocks are probably worth little more than a tulip. Um, could we be seeing over the next few years perhaps a, a, a massive correction where a lot of these unicorn companies supposedly worth more than a billion turn out to be mythical creatures that aren't worth anything like that? Um, well, I think we all already are. I mean, since the start of this year, at least. Um, so one of, and one of the points, as you know, I make in the book is that, um, that all the great speculative bubbles or manias, call them what you will, in history have tended to occur at periods of, of um, abnormally low interest or easy money. And that, that's true actually going back to the tulip mania of the, um, in, in Holland of the 1630s or the, the great Mississippi bubble in France of 1719 and, and the South Sea bubble in Britain in 1720. And then you write, for, write through, we just discussed 1920s, but you go right through Japan and then to the dot-com bubble. And then you go through to the, you know, to the US uh, real estate bubble up to 2007 and and so i and and so one of the things that um one of the problems is that um another function that interest serves is is as a, uh, is is to discount uh future cash flows and as i say in the book if you if you don't have interest you can't really talk about capital because all a capital all a piece of capital is 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 something that is going to generate you in at least hopefully uh, a, a period of future income streams if you have no discount rate then actually the future income streams become infinite and what we've seen in the last uh, 15 years with um with, is this strange combination of the sort of the half dead zombie companies uh, on the one hand, and the second class of, of sort of corporate zombie, which is actually the Silicon Valley unicorns, which are really purely, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying they all are, but as a class, largely speculative endeavors uh, created um, for a variety of reasons. One, because in the period of low rates, investors were desperate for more speculative returns, the higher returns. Uh, secondly, because, you know, with the very low interest rates, uh, uh, so-called growth companies whose income lay in the long distant future attract a higher valuation. And then just because of the sort of the speculative euphoria uh, uh, engendered by, by, the, uh, by, by the low interest rate period. So that those go together. And I think that um, then, then you do get, uh, so to speak, a, a malinvestment because really uh, what you need is, um, is, is, is the discount rate uh, the, the, you know, the, and, and to, to be um, properly set uh, in the market and, the, and to encourage investments with a, an appropriately high return on capital. And many of these uh, Silicon Valley, so, I mean, obviously some of them like Facebook have, have earned extraordinarily high returns on capital, uh, but as I say, as a class, and, and uh, uh, that's not been the case. And then obviously as we go into the pandemic, uh, 
you had this uh, craze for uh, blank check vehicles, uh, so-called special purpose ac acquisition companies that went out uh, and, um, and you know, acquired a, a bunch of, of speculative and, and in some cases uh, fraudulent businesses and you know, proposing you know, space tourism, uh, anything to do with electric vehicles. I think I, I identify a company for ignent, ignent, augmenting human productivity. I, I don't know, it's something to do with uh, fixing um, you know, the brain. I don't know. They, these are, yeah, these, sounds these, rather like the Mississippi company a couple of hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah, not the same. As these, I say they're like the, the South Sea bubble of 1720 had 200 so-called bubble companies that were were founded at the same time. Again, some of them for rather sort of te technical, I think one was called Puckles Machine Gun Company. Well, I mean, that was you know, 200 years before the Maxine machine gun was invented. So uh, the, the and as I say, you, know, you put a, the wrong discount rate and the, you, it makes the future look a lot closer than it actually is. But, but here's some rather terrifying thoughts. Um, an enormous amount of investment over the past couple of decades has been not on businesses' actual profits, but on speculative future profits and future growth. Um, this has been going on for an enormous amount of time. Now, we, we look at the 1920s, a relatively brief period of time when interest rates were too low and there was this um, boom and, and bust. We can see Japan, which had um, in the 1980s an asset bubble, a property asset bubble, and um, again, it was a relatively small period of time over which interest rates were too low. But the terrifying thing is interest rates have been, if this analysis is right, too low for you know 25 years. So presumably, if we are going to have an unlocking of this, the capital and a, a flushing out of the malinvestment, the consequences are going to be massive, aren't they? Yeah, I th I'm afraid to say. I think I mean, I'm not. I don't want to be seen to be a sort of doomsayer because that's not really the purpose. The purpose of the book is really to in improve people's understanding yeah. of, of of interest. And and you know, frankly, if if I've improved their understanding and they end up disagreeing with what I'm saying, that that's fine by me too. However, um, as you, you, I mean, you make a good point. The U.S. had ha you know had the greatest industrial economy in the world in the 1920s. Um, and as I say, most of it remained intact uh, through the Great Depression and um, you know, allowed America, America's sort of world economic primacy to, to continue. Uh, Japan, likewise, uh, ha had a great manufacturing sector um, and that, that, that sort of continued and people were less enthusiastic about it after the bubble burst, but it was still there. Mm. Problem with our economies, as I say in the book, is we, we've we've really sort of developed uh, what I call a bubble economies, and these bubble economies are to to a large extent dependent on the wealth created by expanding the financial sector and by the wealth really of, of, of these various asset price bubbles and we have got to a position where uh, pe people thought that you know the policymakers um, and politicians uh, thought that you could just create prosperity uh, by by as I said lowering interest rates mm -hmm. and creating wealth I mean think last year you know the I think the US economy you know the US uh, S&P 500 delivered I think sort of 27 or 28 percent return last year but that really wasn't you know and this was after you know the you know after after the pandemic had sort of stripped taken these economies to pieces which as you know still they still haven't <laughs> reassembled properly um and and yet people felt you know without people felt they didn't didn't need to save people felt they could live off their capital gains uh, and, and this is particularly true in england the tax take of the government becomes, you know, more and more dependent mm. on the on the bloated financial system, and um, over the last twenty five years, you know, uh, this there's been this continuous process of deindustrialization, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that all all in you know that that necessary industry is better from than services, but if you have sort of bloated services sector sectors that are sort of on, on, on a on a weak foundation of of asset price bubbles and 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 
government borrowing or, 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 or private sector credit growth, then you, you probably do need a, uh, a, you know, really quite a serious transformation of the uh, of the economy and, and it, it doesn't you know i suppose in economic terms you could say that the economy is f is in a state of 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 disequilibrium mm -hmm. and and i don't I, and frankly you know i don't think you're going to get from where we are today to a good place without a great deal of pain and and the energy crisis is is obviously exacerbating that pain. But I, in my book, I would, you know, as you can see, uh, I, I, you know, the energy crisis wasn't quite upon us when I finished the book. Um, and but you can see there would have been problems even. You know, the energy crisis sort of just makes things, you know, a great deal worse. Catalyst, yeah. And um, I, I was very struck in the book. Um, it's first time anyone's properly explained buybacks and how. Um, CEOs of big corporations often do this bit of financial um, wizardry um, to, to um, basically massively inflate their, their share options. Um, reading that made me think, I mean, a lot of what's going on gives free market capitalism a, a bad name. Now, you might say it's not proper free market capitalism, but it, it raised in my mind a fundamental question. Can you be a capitalist system if, in effect, a central bank is setting the price for the allocation of capital and capital is being allocated by government fiat? Um, it was a good, good question. I, I, I mean, as you know, I end the book um, going back to, to Hayek and, and, and talking about his, his most famous book, The Road to Serfdom, which was written in the Second World War. And that was really a book about, you know, how the extension, how, 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 uh, governments in Britain and, and America were extending their powers, uh, taking on wartime powers that Hayek felt wouldn't be um, relinquished. And to, to a large extent, I think Hayek got that wrong. Uh, but he did, made some very interesting comments of, of how a, a sort of bureaucratic class has different, you know, ha has its own sense of, of priorities and, and prejudices, if you will. And um, how they um, and if they are allowed to, um, you know, given full sway uh, as central planners, they will have inadequate knowledge uh, that their actions will tend to uh, to actually exacerbate inequality, uh, to lower growth, and that the system uh, will um, and and that Hayek argues that both democracy and capitalism depend on growth for its acceptance of the ma uh, um, um, uh, of the by the public and 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 Schumpeter makes the same point in his great book um capitalism socialism and democracy and so how can Schumpeter both in the early 1940s thinking that capitalism cannot last and and I'm saying in in the conclusion of my book is that 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 the central bank that we are and it's not really free market capitalism uh, e even those buybacks that you talk about you know frankly had the cost of debt been at a sensible level those buybacks wouldn't have been earnings accretive mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore wouldn't have you know i mean actually basic you know modern finance theory tells you that buybacks shouldn't lead to to uh, to higher stock prices, they should lead to more volatile stock prices, yeah. but no no aggregate gain. So the fact that 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 there was a apparently a gain from buybacks is telling me, at least, that the interest rates were set too low. And I I and as I say, the the interest is the most important price in capitalism. I cite one economist, Jeremy Steen at at Harvard, saying that interest alone gets into all the cracks. Of the system and then strangely enough Karl Marx makes actually the same point and and you know all the great economists understand the pervasiveness of interest even frankly when you're sort of when you're buying a durable book you're or a durable good like a piano or something embedded in the value of the piano is is is, is its time value and there's no I mean even you read books about you know it's the, commun you know, the economies of uh, the economies of the 
uh, of communist societies. The re one of the reasons they failed was that they didn't they didn't properly price the use of capital over time. So you had this sort of constant misallocations. It's, it's um, also a reality check. Um, it is, and 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 frankly, we um, you know we need. I mean, I think there is. I don't actually in my book sort of try to sort of come up with sort of policy prescriptions. I think, you know, I leave that to, to, you know, to, to someone else. But uh, it seems to me you either have to go to a system uh, where you, um, I'm not saying a gold standard per se, but a, 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 a monetary system where the sort of basic monetary unit cannot be manipulated or created by policymakers. Um, yeah, um, or, or the alternative is we need to move away from this narrow inflation targeting idea to and to take on board an, a, a greater uh, variety of, of factors, you know, such, such as um, you know, credit growth, leverage, um, capital allocation, blah blah blah. You, in other words, what you need. I mean, frankly, you, all you need to do is to sort of have a sort of dose of common sense in monetary policy. Uh, if you're not going to go for the more revolutionary uh, idea of, of changing the monetary standard. Might it be, I mean, 51 years ago, almost the day, Nixon broke the link between, the final link between dollar and gold. And you could almost say that the more that currencies in the Western world have become paper currencies, fiat currencies, the more problematic this issue of central bankers and monetary management has become. You know, Friedman never really produced a convincing answer when he said you've got to control the money supply because what is what is money? Um, it, it's such a vague concept. Once you start targeting something and the target becomes a measure, um, the, you know, it, 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 it becomes not a, 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 a lodestar, but more of a planet. It, it wobbles. Um, yeah. Might it might it be that actually and it's something that I, I, particularly interests me that it could be that fractional reserve banking is maybe part of the problem if you have a hundred percent fiat currency and you have the unrestricted ability of banks to create credit credit ceases to be savings based on someone's deferred consumption and and that's part of the problem could we perhaps need to revisit the whole question of fractional reserve banking i i once introduced in parliament a bill to curb fractional reserve banking um and it was um, wonderfully ignored. But I, I wonder if perhaps actually it's it's the unrestricted, I'm not against fractional reserve banking, but the lack of limitations on it could be the problem. Well, I mean, yeah, no, I, I mean, again, that that's an idea of, of the Austrian school, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the problem is that with fractional reserve banking where uh, commercial banks can, in effect, create deposits with loans or take, create money um and then <laughs> they you know you could then feed through to the sort of boom and bust process mm -hmm. and if you then have a central bank uh standing by to bail them out during the bust um you get you know this the, what they call the sort of debt super cycle of debt getting higher and higher um i think i mean as you probably know you're, you're never realistically going to um get um any proper reform until people are utterly um, despairing of the current system. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think that um, you know that I think that that I'm. I think that credit should. I don't. I don't, I think that part of the problem is fractional reserve banking, and that the answer. And and I I, I cite right at the you know the uh, last part of my postscript that. That you know, uh, a friend of mine called Thomas Meyer, who was the the former chief economist at Deutsche Bank, he suggested that a a, a central bank digital currency that was uh, constitutionally limited to a fixed amount of growth uh, could and 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 that would uh, in in effect uh, when you had your deposits, it would be in these uh, these uh, this this digital currency. And we can leave aside the privacy concerns and so forth. Of of the CBDCs for a moment that he and that then the credit activities 
uh, would have to be done by, you know, so to speak, hedge funds or private equity funds or, 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 or small firms, which would be then lending. And you could have leverage and so on and so forth, but the, it, would it would be outside of a banking system uh, who's, who, when it collapsed, um, you know, threatened the, the livelihoods of all and, and the economy. And the, I'm, this, wouldn't, this would sort of take one back uh, to um, you know, really what one had in the 19th, 19th century. Now, I mean, you know, the 19th century was not uh, you know, a period of calm. I mean, there, were, there were regular financial crises of uh, periods of, of insolvencies and so forth of, um, and, and quite a lot of economic volatility. Uh, but um, it was a system in which um, delivered higher, I mean, well, you know, sustained growth and and price stability over a longer period i think that uh, you know the advice well, you know the problems with gold standard was simply you know you, you had these sort of difficulties of of actually uh, getting hold of gold at some stage so it's a bit arbitrary to, um but, but basing everything on 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 the on gold discoveries and 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 techniques for refinement but yes i i think we would it would be uh, attractive to move to 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 reconsider at least what, what's called the Chicago plan, yeah. uh, you know, of, of moving away from fractional reserve and having sort of, you know, fully monetary backed banking system. It would be more stable and having the credit operations outside. But I don't think you're going to get there until things have gotten a lot worse. People are not going to be open to that idea. Like, for instance, Doug, this conversation we're having now, I mean, I, I mean I've had these ideas about sort of, the errors of price stability for 20 years and no one really was interested they're only really beginning to be interested in now when they see the failure of the central bank's uh, uh recent central bank regime but this is why i think your book is so brilliantly timed i mean um right i think this week um the central bankers of the world are getting together in in jackson hole um have you had much interest in your book? Have you been asked to speak? Um... No. <laughs> I mean, you're probably aware the, the the central banking fraternity is very very sort of close knit, uh, uh, tied in with with the academic world. I think the Fed is the largest uh, employer of of um, of people with um, with PhDs in monetary economics in the world, and they. It's very uh, inward looking that world. The the only people one finds um, who 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 are more open minded tend to be sort of retired central bankers uh, like Mervyn King, who used to run the Bank of England, and then sort of when he left uh, after the global financial crisis, sort of realised that the entire regime was wrong and that conventional uh, economics had you know had gone astray. I mean, there, there are a lot of group thinkers, as you say, amongst the central banking fraternity. But there, there are some heroes. There's, who's the chap? Claudio Borio of the Bank of International Settlements. I mean, he's managed to become a central, probably the central banker's central banker. And he's he's full of ideas that actually might have some traction in the future. Yeah, the Bank of International Settlements is a um, is, is, is an extraordinary exception. It's a bit like sort of Sweden in the wave of lockdowns. You know, it was, it's, it's, you know, so some reason God said that we could have one, you know, one institution that was not part of the group think. And for, for, for uh, you know, for 20 years now, the BIS has been putting out really uh, excellent papers, un, un, firstly under Borio's um, predecessors, chief economist, uh, Bill White, and then under Borio himself, they put out papers analyzing all the problems of, um, of ultra low interest rates and the problems of central banks fixating on this 2% inflation target um, and the cognitive dissonance created by that because they then fail to notice anything that is sort of outside of this narrow remit, or if they do, they sort of dismiss it rather angrily. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, of course, uh, one of the features of groupthink is that um, you know the more, uh, more uh, the more under attack the group feels, the more uh, the the more the the stronger they hold their beliefs, and the more 
uh, dismissive and aggressive they are to their critiques. I think that the set that, that after the global financial crisis, uh, the Fed uh, and the other central banks are pretty good at trying to sort of push off any responsibility for what had happened. I think that now uh, people's uh, toleration is um, is gone. I think that people were prepared to give the central banks credence as long as the central banks could carry on inflating asset prices. Yeah. That was the sort of that was the sort of devil's deal. But I, now I remember being I remember being authoritatively told by Robert Peston on television that it was uh, lack of appropriate regulation that caused that 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 bubble. I mean, it's extraordinary how how well, I mean, analysis had was. Yes, and and as I say, um, you know, I I cite someone who says that sort of. You know, sound monetary policy is is a necessary and sufficient condition for a uh, for a, a, a robust financial system. It's only when the interest rates uh, fall too low and you get this um, you know these Ponzi schemes and these credit bubbles and these asset price bubbles that the system becomes unstable. And as I point out, that that you, you know the the people in the financial world are very good at what we call regulatory arbitrage, which is getting around uh, whatever rules uh, are in place. And and so, I mean, you know, frankly, uh, we have you know many more regulators. I think I can't remember off the top of my head. I cite somewhere. I think I'm saying right, saying that you know um, in the post-war period you had one regu banking regulator in the city for seven thousand city workers. Now it's something like one for every three hundred. Uh, you you know again, if you set the price of leverage the price of risk too low, you'll get a huge amount of risk and leverage. And you could have an infinite number of um, of supervisors, of regulators, and it would never really do the trick. Edward, you've been very generous with your time. Um, I can't tell you what a pleasure it has been to talk to you. And your book, I think, is going to be one of those books that people are going to talk about for years to come. Um, I, uh, I, I wish you every success in promoting it. Are you, are you going to be touring America talking about it? Uh, I seem to be virtually touring so far. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much and, and best of luck with it. Thank you.